Two little mice fell into a bucket of cream. The first mouse quickly gave up and drowned, but the second mouse, he struggled so hard that he eventually churned that cream into butter. And he walked out. Amen. Welcome to Successful Dropout. This podcast is for the outliers, the innovators, the rebels, those that dare to dream and act on their dreams. I'm your host, Kylan Ginger. Join me as we find out what it takes to drop out, grind, and succeed. What's up, fam squad? I've got some pretty exciting news. If you listen to the podcast much, you know we've been building a pretty vibrant community of truly, truly extraordinary people who have committed to an unconventional route through life. The Successful Dropout audience has been growing a lot, and I get a lot of people reaching out to me now with all sorts of questions regarding education, dropping out, opting out, entrepreneurship, resources, networking, etc. So much so that I decided it was time to create a more accessible community on Facebook so that we can all ask and answer these kinds of questions together, as well as celebrate our successes and encourage each other during um, inevitable adversity. So I've created a closed Facebook group, and I want to invite you to join it. If you follow Successful Dropout, if you resonate with our philosophy and want to help me grow this thriving community, go to SuccessfulDropout.com forward slash group. This community is for the rebels, the outliers, the innovators, the doers, and those who dare to dream and act on their dreams. If you're a dropout, an opt-out, if you're thinking about doing one of those things, if you're a parent, even if you aren't any of those things and you graduated school, I want to invite you to join. All that matters is that you resonate with the successful dropout philosophy and that you enter the group with the intention to provide value to the other members and not just receive value yourself. Again, go to SuccessfulDropout.com forward slash group to request admission. Once you're a part of the group, introduce yourself and get involved and I'll see you there. What is up, successful dropouts? Get stoked because today on the show we have Manish Sethi. The epitome of what it means to be a life hacker, Manish Sethi went to travel the world using hacked plane tickets shortly after graduating from Stanford University. He created his website, Hack the System, with the intention of showing his readers how to achieve the lifestyle of their dreams and teaching them how to get free plane tickets. His latest project, Pavlock, is a little magical haptic feedback wearable that helps train habits, improve athletic performance, and train learning. Uh, You can know more about Manish and Pavlok at pavlok.com, and we'll have links to everything we talk about today in the show notes. But uh, Manish, that is the intro I have for you, man, but tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Sure, yeah. So um, I was a student at uh, Stanford in California, and I had a. um, I found out that about two years into Stanford, I decided to do a study abroad year, and I studied in Italy. And I discovered that you could just like take time off from college, up to two years off at Stanford with no questions asked, no problems. And um, it was actually way cheaper to like go to a school, like for one quarter, once once one quarter of tuition uh, at Stanford, I could pay for like a full year of travel. <laughs> and so I decided to try it out and take a leave of absence. And I did. And then um, so I showed up and I started traveling. I lived in Italy, Spain, Argentina, Brazil, um, India in those two years. And along the way, I started a blog, a uh, blog called Hack the System where I started to kind of chronicling my story and then letting my readers vote what I would do and where I would go. Hmm. Um, So I ended up taking those two years off, uh, went back to school and finished up with um, my final quarter being in Berlin with study abroad uh, with Stanford because it was like a cool way to take my final quarter. Right. And they have this really interesting tactic. uh, They have this really interesting program at Stanford in Berlin where you could get an internship, 100% paid for by Stanford, as long as you work 40 hours. So somebody in Berlin gets a free intern, you get a full-time salary. Huh. Um, and so what I did was I, I had my friend hire me to work 10 hours a week and tell them I worked 40. <laughs> and then I outsourced my 10 hours a week to India. So I was getting a full-time stipend without having to do any work at all during the summer, which is really cool. Um, and so then I was like, I was still like a student and I was asking my readers what I should do when I was in Berlin for three months. Um, and 
they we we did a voting thing and i decided i would be try to become a famous dj in berlin was the was the pitch me and a friend started a youtube channel called 90 days where we basically tried to hack the berlin dj scene um you know, we, we called up clubs. We told them that we were well-known in the U.S. for house and dubstep. We built, like, a fake fan site and bought Facebook fans. And within a year, or within within 30, or I think within 40 days, we were flown around Europe playing shows for, like, over 1,000 people, like, in, in Warsaw and, and all over. <laughs> and it's really, it's pretty sweet. And so that ended. Um, I came back to, to the U.S., and I still was, you know, I never graduated. I, I liked that story that I was still, like, a Stanford dropout. It was kind of a good story. Um, so what happened is my readership kept growing. We kept doing voting. They kept voting on stuff I should do. And one became about how could I do, how could I improve my productivity? So it was like, how do I improve my productivity? Um, I was really bad at writing articles. I always wanted to write two a week and I could never write two a week. And so, um, I had an idea and I decided to have, I hired a girl to follow me around. And every time I got off task, she would slap me in the face. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah. And I, I, I made a recording of it, and uh, I, I wrote blog posts. I got five months of work done, like five days. It was insane. Um, <laughs> so you just told her, like, whenever you're on Facebook, or you just you gave her she a list of stuff. She just sat next to me and watched not... me. She just sat next to me. So she's like, Manisha, are you working on anything? Manisha, are you working on anything? Manisha, are you working on anything? And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense, right? Like, if you're going to – like, people get distracted all the time. But if there's someone there telling you, hey, what are you doing? What are you doing? If you're trying to quit smoking and there's someone who just stands next to you and they are always there, yeah, like you're not going to smoke. Uh, and so I wrote a blog post about this because I mean I got like 50 or 60 articles done in like five days. It was insane. Right. Um, and and I only paid her like eight bucks an hour on Craigslist or something. This was before. This was in 2008 or nine. No, I don't know what year it was. No, it must have been 2012. And um, so anyway, I got a, I post online. And it became super viral. Uh, it was in like. I was on NPR, Anderson Cooper, all around the world, like hundreds of sources. And I started thinking, how can I make this another interesting storyline? So I created, so I was like, oh, what if I made a wearable that just like shocks me every time I go on Facebook? Um, and so my friend uh, and I, we bought a dog shock collar and a little Arduino unit. We hacked it together. And like in 48 hours, we had this little device that every time I went on Facebook, it would shock me. You know, really hacky. But uh, and I made a video about this thing I was about to post online, and then I thought to myself, this is actually really interesting. There's a million wearables out there that track what I do. This one's actually changing what I do. Maybe there's something deeper here. Maybe there's a better, more than just a funny blog post. Um, and so that became the idea for what I do now for the last four years, which is Pavlock, the wearable device that uses vibration, beep, electric shock to help you form good habits and break bad habits. Uh, <laughs> And that's what I do. I, yeah. I love that, man. I mean, we have a dog who barks a lot and stuff, and so I'm always getting her shock collars. I think we've been like through through five or six. So, yeah, and they've always they've got that kind of the shock, the beep, and then the the vibrating function on there. But that that's a really cool idea. And so does it does it just uh, like I notice? I, I think I looked at your website, and like you say, it helps people break the habit of say like twirling their hair or biting nails and stuff. Cause it, does it just sense the, the movement and, and like the, the vertical position of your arm and start shocking you or. So it depends on the habit. Realistically, it's a behavior trainer, just like how, um, you train a dog. Yep. You can train yourself. So like, think about some, okay. So basically here's what happened. We started off with it being an operant conditioning device where it would vibrate when you were doing good habits, like sticking to your rest. Like if you, I use rescue time, which gives you a productivity score. And so I made a little Chrome extension where if I was over 80% productive, I would get vibrations and Chrome notifications that would say, good job. You're doing a great job. Good job. <laughs> and then if I got under 50%, it would beep and under 30%, it would zap me. Right. And huh. so it kept me in line. That was cool. Started using it as an operant conditioning device like that. Um, then we started using it as an alarm clock, which is unrealistically effective. It's like the the type of people who buy our alarm clock, it's, it's called the shock clock. Um, they, they're often college kids, but they're often like people with narcolepsy or serious sleep disorders. And they've just never been able to get out of bed before. Um, so that's that's like just it just works. It's like pouring water in your face. The shock uh, clock. <laughs> My gosh. Yeah. Um, but then what happened is about a year and a half into our company, we discovered a litany of about a litany of studies, about 21 studies on what was known as aversion therapy, 
which is Pavlovian conditioning to break bad habits. And it used to be a very common type of therapy in the U.S. In fact, it was an FDA-approved type of science. Not saying that my device is FDA-cleared. We have to show some paperwork, file a 510K. Mm -hmm. Not saying we're a medical device. But the science behind aversion therapy or aversive conditioning is associating a negative sensation with a habit that you want to stop doing. So, like, think about um, how hard it is to quit nail biting, right? Yeah. Um, it's just you don't. The problem is you don't notice when you're you're not aware of when you're biting your nails. Mm -hmm. It's your subconscious mind doing it, and it's too late. You can't zap a dog an hour after they do a bad habit, or uh, yeah. like after they ran, to, because it doesn't know why. Yep. Uh, and so, what aversion therapy is is a five day program where you do the bad habit and get zapped at the same time. So for five minutes a day, five days, you bring your hand to your face and you can just, if you, uh, the most simple version is you just press the button, you bring it to your face and press the button, bring it so to you're, your face. You're and... shocking yourself. Literally. Yeah, literally. Um, it's a training, it's a, it's a training mechanism. Gotcha. Uh, it's a lot like you ever get like really drunk on tequila and then get sick and then never drink tequila again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about? I do. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people have it with tequila. Um, we have a lot of people who call, who have it with uh, uh, Captain Morgan's a lot. And um, anyway, um, so there's Daniels. this feeling right, the, <laughs> yeah, right in the pit of your stomach that you'll feel if you smell or even think about it. Um, and that feeling is always right in the pit of the stomach and it's visible in the brain. And that's called an aversion. And what hap it happens when a seriously negative association occurs at the same time as any habit you used to do. Hmm. And it's weird because in one day, you'll never drink tequila again. Like I can never have Frosted Flakes again because I, I ate it once when I was eight, like seven, and it was just gross. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, we found out that you could make long-lasting, massive changes in behavioral habits in less than a few weeks utilizing our product. Hmm. Uh, and we hadn't even known that. Uh, and so what we've been doing then, we spent a lot of time going after the bad habits route, trying to help people quit smoking, nail biting, unhealthy eating, sleeping in, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and now fi and finally we're releasing Pavlock two, which is a much smarter version of our device. looks a lot sexier. You can program in hand emotions. So it knows when you're biting your nails and knows when you're scratching and knows the difference between biting and chewing and which nail you're biting. Um, okay. and it's able to, and it's basically an open platform. Uh, think of like the app store on a phone. Yeah. So we have an app store for developers to develop apps that can vibrate, beep, and release electrical shocks. Huh. And that's what we do. And it all, I'm sorry, and it also now has tracking behavior so you can read, the developers can read what they're doing, the motions they're doing. For example, we can detect if you're doing jumping jacks or if you're doing push-ups or if you're working out um, and then be able to read that motion and operate upon that data or just be able to send data. Like if you're playing a video game, we have a game called Zappy Bird where it's like Flappy Bird, but you get vibrations when you're doing a good job and you get zapped when you die <laughs> stuff like that um so it's basically an open platform for behavior change and haptic feedback huh that's crazy man is there anybody else doing anything like this right now no one it's really been four years and no one it's crazy yeah it's like <laughs> crazy it's insane and it's it's a, it's a weird feeling like um there's the, I don't know, it's, uh, I was at CES two years ago, and there was this company next to me called Braggy, which was these in-ear Bluetooth headphones. Right. Waterproof. And um, people would, like, come up to our table, and they'd be like, uh, I don't think people are going to shock themselves, or, like, I'm not sure about this, like, does it really work? So we had, like, yes and no people, but next to us was Braggy with this giant line of people who were, like, you know, out the door almost. Because <laughs> um, it's obviously a good idea in-ear Bluetooth headphones. Like, that didn't exist two years ago. Right. Obviously a good idea. And what happened is that Braggy finally released their product this year, and AirPods were already out, hmm. and the LG HBS is already out, and if you go on Alibaba, you'll find, a, like, a thousand suppliers who will sell you in-ear Bluetooth headphones. <laughs> yep. But meanwhile, if you go to Alibaba and you make a copy of Pavlock, like, what would you even search for? Like shock device, human shock device. Like there's no, there's nothing, there's no category, right? And so we we really we've been like working slowly. I've not been taking funding. I've been trying to build this up slowly so I can get it right. And um, there's nobody competing. It's really weird. Yeah, like it, it's really funny because I actually um. I've actually, I wrote down in my notes probably two weeks ago, there was kind of a phase where I was posting just, just different random business ideas that I've had um, on Facebook. 
and like one of them was like what if you could create a device that like shocked you when you and, and it sensed motion or something like that and you could help train habits because i just finished reading uh this book on on habits by uh uh i can't remember the the author's name but charles duhigg yes thank you that one uh, i just finished that one Power so of habit. Good book. Power of Habit. Yeah, it was an amazing book. And, and so then when I got introduced to you, I was like, this is awesome. Like somebody actually created this and I might I might have to get one myself, man. It's a really neat idea. Sure um, so. so so tell me about uh, the the plane ticket hacking, okay? Because I, I Googled, Googled your name just to learn a little bit more about you before this interview. And I found this massive Reddit thread, you know, from four years ago. Um, so, you know, it's a little old, but about you talking about kind of hacking you know, for free plane tickets and stuff like that with, with credit cards. Is that something that you still do? Is that a method that still works? It still works. Um, I don't do it anymore because I have a much easier method, which is just well, spending a shit ton of money on credit cards. <laughs> yeah. um, but and I also have no time anymore to travel. I have like infinite points and no time. But uh, so how it works is this. This is what I used to do. This was my big like claim to fame in the original days was uh, credit card hacking. So it's a little harder now than it used to be, but you know how they always offer points for bonus if you sign up for a credit card? Yep. Mm -hmm. Like 40,000 points? Just did that, yeah. <laughs> which, which card? Uh, it was an American Express gold card, and I got like 54,000 miles. Cool. Yeah, you got 50,000 Amex rewards points, which or are interesting. But anyway. That, yeah. Um, yeah, so what happens is that uh, like a lot of tickets, so like a, a normal domestic trip, if you book enough time in advance, is like 25,000 points round trip. And a normal trip to Europe is like between 50 to 80,000 points round trip, but also to South America, like 50 to 80,000 points round trip, right? So what happens is that I would sign up for like one card and then two cards and then like six or eight cards at a time. So I'd be racking up like 200,000 points at once. And then I would just do their minimum requirements, which uh, would be like spend $1,000 on a card or something. And um, and then I would just cancel and then re-sign up and then cancel and then re-sign up and then cancel and re-sign up. And I was churning these cards in a way that would be extremely profitable in miles. And it actually built my credit score up to be very high because I always made my payments on time. Gotcha. And okay. so that was the model back then. It's got a little harder now because you can't churn the same card unless you wait 18 months. Okay. So what you do though is you just get like right now if you go out and you sign up for two cards. Let's say you want to go to Europe or you want to go to South America. Go get two cards that are American Airlines cards. Um and they will that'll be enough points. That's it. And then at that point you can just keep the cards. Like there's only two cards. You just spend on it, you know. Right. Um and so like that's how that's how I would get tickets and you get like I would I was I was long term traveling. So like a one way ticket would go to South America and to Europe. And the nice thing about it is that they, they price the tickets by sector, by zones. So like the price to go to a normal big airport is the same as going to the tiny airport that you really want to go to. Right. Oh, interesting. So, so like I would fly into Florence, which would have been an extra thousand dollars if I bought it on dollars, but it would be right. the same price as if I flew into Rome or, or Milan. Gotcha. I see. So how many credit cards do you think you, you have right now then? <laughs> oh, I wish I had more right now. <laughs> Um, but anyway, fucking manufacturing is a hell of a business, but anyway, no, it's, um, I probably have like eight or 10 right now, but it's not really a game anymore. Cause like I spend I probably a hundred thousand dollars a month on, on my card. So I actually earn a hundred thousand points at least a month. Gotcha. So it's like, it's just like, yeah, now it's, now it's like not even a cycle anymore. I wouldn't do the churning cause it's just too much work. I suppose. Yeah. And I suppose that makes sense too. I mean, my first thought was like, well, wouldn't they, you know, try to catch you on that? But I guess the credit card companies are still making money if you're reaching those minimum requirements so well I'm, what happens is that a lot of people don't pay off on time and then they get interest charges so go oh, gotcha so like the one the, I, my one rule here is um is if you are gonna do this method make sure you're not a fucking idiot <laughs> <laughs> make sure you're not because this happens to so many people i didn't realize it maybe because i'm indian and i like i'm afraid of debt but like yeah, so many people I'm like do this and they do it and they don't pay off the card and they're like, oh, now I have too much credit card debt. I'm like, mother, god damn it! <laughs> so make sure you're not an idiot. Make sure you're gonna pay it off on time. That's it. No, I'm I'm right with you, man. I'm super anal about all that stuff, debt and paying paying our credit cards off every month and 
stuff like that. Well, that that's sweet, man. If if anybody wants to find out more about that, can they just go to uh, hackingthesystem.com or hackthesystem.com? Um, yeah, I have one article that's good that'll give you a primer. Again, this isn't my business anymore. Um, so I'll send you this if you want. Like, I, I think this is way, way relevant for college kids and not relevant for me anymore. But like, I wrote an article called, let's see, what's it called? Uh, Median Travel System. It's called How to Fly Business Class to Medellin, Colombia for $77 is what it's called. <laughs> and I'm going to send you that in chat. So you can post that. Um, and then I would recommend if you're still interested, in like, read that. It's, I think it's probably the best primer online or primer online that's like an intro to the concept um you know in my in my super biased opinion but uh <laughs> super biased but um after you read that the website that i care i still read about is the points guy.com they're pretty good okay gotcha so, yeah. awesome man um so so you just mentioned before we started the interview here that you actually officially graduated like uh, just a few months ago is that correct yeah, it's another example of hacking the system. So I really enjoyed being a college dropout. And then I actually did like a pilot for the travel channel, which was uh, the first 10 seconds of it was like, hi, I'm in safety. I dropped out of college two years ago to travel the world. And so I couldn't be back on it when I was like potentially being on the show. And so, but you know, it's like also kind of fun. I like being like contrary. Right. And what happened though, is I found out at Harvard, I'm in Boston, my company's based in Boston. There's this program called Harvard Extension School, which is a master's program that you can go and get a master's. And I'm trying to run clinical trials on my product, and it's like really expensive to do clinical trials, like really expensive. <laughs> and um, but if you're in university, it's not that hard. And so I was like, wait, how do I do Harvard Extension School? And it turns out there's like it's like a backdoor into Harvard, where like you take classes before you apply, and as long as you get B's in the three classes, you're guaranteed admission into Harvard really? in the extension school. Yeah. And so I was like, wow, this is an amazing opportunity. Like, number one, I'll get to run trials. Number two, instead of being the college, it's funny being a college dropout when you're traveling the world. It's not so funny when you're making a wearable device that's helping people with trichotillomania, smoking, nail biting, odd stuff. <laughs> like, it's, it's people kind of want a doctor. People want someone who's got a freaking degree, right? Right. Um, and secondly, and, and like, most importantly, it's like, I mean, I mean, that was the most, that was the most important. And most importantly, it was like the clinical studies are really expensive, but it'd be easy and fun to conduct it myself. So um, when I found out about that, I was like, all right, let me do it. So I did. And then I just, as of like yesterday, I got my acceptance. I'm going to put it on camera for you because you can see. Well, I guess no one else can, but uh, check that out. Uh, Manish Sethi has been accepted into the uh, Harvard Extension School as a clinical psychologist. Or a clinical hey, look psychologist. at that. <laughs> so I'm going to be getting a master's in clinical psych. Um, and so that's as of right now. And um, what's really cool, though, is like, you know, when you were in college, you ever take like a psych class? I was only in college for a few months. <laughs> That's you in high the school, show. Did you take a psych class? Um, I didn't actually. Uh-uh. Philosophy. Okay, well, got it. If you ever take a psych class, um, you'll have to design an experiment and then you'll have to actually conduct the experiment, which means you got to go and recruit subjects. Gotcha. And that means asking your friends and begging them, please come in. I need to do this survey thing with you. Please do it. <laughs> Um, but instead now, like I was in the statistics class and I was in this research design class and it was like, I get to design a study and then I get to just instantly test it on my 50,000 users. And I'm like, this is so much fun. This is like so much fun, like running real statistical methods on this stuff. So, uh, I'm actually really enjoying it. That's sweet. So 50,000 users is that you, there's 50,000 people wearing the, the Pavlock right now. I wish that there were 50,000 people wearing it right now. Um, there's like 50,000 people who have purchased it. Probably about sixty-five thousand app installations, and probably about ten thousand people wearing it at any given time. Gotcha. Can you actually? Is there like a software connected where you can actually track like yeah. who's wearing it and using it? Actually. Yeah, yeah, I mean it's Bluetooth connected to your phone, so I know if it's on. Gotcha. If it's just being used, and then I have analytics mixed panel. I can see. Gotcha. It's kind of fun. It's like live streaming. Sometimes I just watch what people are doing. It's yeah, seriously. Cool. <laughs> I bet. So what's what's kind of the the long term vision for it, or or is that still becoming clear? Um, I have, I mean, it changes all the time, but not really. I have two goals with the product, and two goals with the company. Um, so one side of it is medical, which is um, like legitimately, I really fucking hate the medical and pharmaceutical industry. Mm -hmm. I think it's broken. 
Yeah, I think it's been broken for about 15 years, and I think that they aren't understanding the. Ch- like, for example, I have a version of Pavlov that I want to get FDA cleared for quitting smoking. We have to file paperwork and show electrical safety standards. Hmm. File it. It's called a 510k. The thing is, it takes about six months and fifty thousand dollars to do this, um, which, in the grand scheme of things, compared to clinical trials, is not that much. The issue is that if I ever update the app ever, I have to run another five ten k fifty thousand dollar thing, six month thing. We update the app every fucking week. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Like it doesn't make any sense. So what has to happen is that I have to sell an inferior product for way more money because it's the FDA cleared version. Whereas to my regular consumers, I can sell a much better version that costs much less. <laughs> and that's just stupid. It's just stupid. So like to regular consumers, they're getting a version where they can train and track their hand motion detection. And like it knows when they're smoking and connects with a coach. To um, the medical device company, if I run my FDA right now, I'll have to send them an audio CD and a device that doesn't connect to your phone. It's just stupid. Wow. Right? It's just stupid. And so to me, it's like, and number, and number two, like, I don't know, if you've ever gone into, if you've ever, uh, a lot of people have ADHD or think they have ADHD and they go talk to their psychiatrist and they do a test and then they are like, the first thing they do is they give you a prescription for Adderall, right? Mm-hmm. Um, or another drug. Um, or if you come in with like, bloating or painful stomach or you're hurting or you scratch uh, you have trictillomania or hair picking they just give you a drug every time a drug a drug a drug a drug you're trying to quit smoking a drug right. it's a drug like it's always a drug no one ever takes a step back and asks them hey uh how many hours are you sleeping <laughs> what kind of foods are you eating how much water are you drinking do you ever exercise and do you ever meditate like if everybody in the world started doing those five things I bet you'd see a lot of problems disappearing. <laughs> Very true. Makes sense. Right? Yep. And so with regards to that, I think that and like with regards to that, when you're looking at bad habits, which are kind of all of the problems that's like the um, behavior, what do they call lifestyle diseases? Mm-hmm. It's like obesity, diabetes, uh, two and all that thing. It's all based on lifestyle habits. It's habits, habits that aren't being broken. It's not about the symptoms. Like, yeah, I can take a nicotine patch to not feel the, 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 the craving for cigarettes. Yeah. But like you saw in the power of habit, it's not about the craving. It's about the getting up and going outside. It's about your friends are all smoking in a circle. It's about the habit, not about the cravings. Yep. That's why people will quit smoking for two months. The cravings are gone after two weeks, but they still pick it back up. Right. <laughs> That's why rehab barely works. Um, so what happened here is that, uh, so what I'm talking about is this, I, I'm trying to split my company into two companies. So the first company that we have right now is called behavioral technology group. And I hope to split it by the end of this year, looking more likely like next year into behavioral medical group, behavioral medical group will go ahead and get FDA clearance and focus on behavior change for medical purposes, getting insurance into the system, getting a FDA approved product, doing clinical trials and getting that dealt with. Right. Gotcha. Uh, I don't really want, I don't want to deal with that stuff. I'll be like a like chairman, but I won't be the CEO of that company. Um, with my company, uh, Behavioral Technology Group, I have one major vision, which is about changing what money means. I feel like money has been slutted out over the last generation, where money is what other people pay you to do the things that they want you to do. Hmm. So I think it's true. Makes sense, right? Yeah. The problem is that we're in this kind of post-scarcity society where like, all right, if I'm a regular kid at home and money is like, money, like I gotta go get, I should get a job. But like I could also just stay at my parents' house in an air-conditioned room, watching Netflix, smoking weed, and pooping on a goddamn toilet, living like better than any king of even fifty years ago, much less a, a thousand years ago lived, right? right? So like, why would I? Why would I get a job when I can just enjoy life better than any ever human being ever in the history of humanity has ever lived? The reason, the problem is that money has been, has changed the purpose. Money became a point system. It's like frequent flyer miles. It doesn't mean anything. It's an exchange for an exchange for an exchange. And I think that money should be you paying yourself for doing things that you want yourself to do. I think that you should be rewarded when you hit your own goals. That's my vision. So the way that I'm trying to create that is that within our app, we have an app. We're releasing this in about two weeks. It's called Volts. It's an in-app point system where you earn volts by hitting healthy goals that you set for yourself. And then it unlock it'll like the more volts you have, the more you can unlock the other features within our app. Very okay. simple. Right now it's just an like in-game point system. As soon as we get basically end of next year, I, I'm planning on an ICO. So I convert it into a blockchain currency where you mine coin by hitting healthy daily positive goals. 
So you'll actually make physical money on an exchange by going to the gym. Basically, you earn shares in a stock when you hit your daily goal that you can sell for money. And that's what? the vision of those. That's the vision of my company. So those are the two companies. I want to cure addiction. Or sorry, I can't say that. End addiction and replace current the meaning of money. Two small goals. So like as <laughs> so ba- okay. So that last part was really interesting. So like basically as people. Um, you know, pick up good habits and end bad ones. They're they're almost like earning. Well, they're earning actual money, but in the form of like a cryptocurrency or stock. Yeah, exactly. Or... Exactly, cryptocurrency. Huh. Think about getting Bitcoin every time you hit the gym. That's what I'm doing. So are you? Uh, and sorry if these are dumb questions, but basically, are you, are you like creating your own cryptocurrency then for this? Or so it's fucking, it'll likely start off as like a. Uh, have you ever heard of like token like? You know Ethereum? Yes, yeah. Ethereum has like a plat. Ethereum is more than a blockchain. It's like a platform for blockchain. So other people can build their own cryptos on top of ETH, uh, on top of Ether. Okay. And so what happens is it just solves a lot of a lot of problems. Um, like for example, instead of it taking instead of you needing millions of people to 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 run machines to do the the calculations, um, and needing like hundreds of thousands of lines of code. It's like you need zero people to do it, and it's 200 lines of code, and it's already on GitHub. You just fork it. So uh, what we'll be doing is basically what happens is that you'll be earning a representation of Ether that you can buy and sell. You can sell for Ether, which automatically and instantly converts into dollars. Gotcha. So so it's like – so my answer is we're building our own crypto on top of a crypto. I see. Okay. That's what, like, if you heard of Litecoin or, like, any of the coins, the Ripple, all the ones that just came out in the last, like, Litecoin, six months, I've heard Ether, of, yeah. Yeah, all of them are being built upon um, Ether because it's a platform. It's like uh, writing an iOS app. You're writing a, um, it's like Ruby on Rails. Like, it's the Rails. It's like writing an iOS app. You're writing code on top of iOS. Um, it's like that. Really interesting. I mean, it, and actually, I was just talking to a buddy about, you know, cryptocurrencies and stuff, and, I, like, I know... I know almost nothing about it, just that it's becoming kind of a kind of a bigger deal, and there seems to be some some opportunity there. I mean, I, I guess is there like with these new currencies coming out and stuff? It's just something that I mean, it depends what opportunity means, right? If you're saying, "Can I make a lot of money on crypto?" Yeah, yeah, absolutely, right, absolutely. It's not even like hard, um, but if you don't care about money and you care about behavior change which is me i don't believe in money i don't believe in money at all um i i don't know what like what is success you have to define your own version of success and, and unfortunately for most of the people probably listen to this podcast society defined success for you by saying success is making enough money that you can pay off your student loans that you didn't need to get taken in the first place you know yep um and i think that um people who drop out of drop out of college are getting it that there's a fucking it's not even a scam it's just a fundamental like it's what happens in a triangle of payments, which is like healthcare and university, where the person paying doesn't understand that they, they don't actually pay the right amount at the time of, and it, it's collected in a different way. So what happens is there's this giant um, circle of, of capitalism that is what, what happened to those two industries. Um, so long story short, what I'm saying is that there's opportunity. If you're talking about making money, yeah, you can make money in crypto. I'm not going to recommend anything. I don't know the future. Mm-hmm. I have my own long-term plans. My guess is that if you were to buy and hold uh, any of the top three cryptos, you would be very wealthy. But I can't recommend that whatsoever. Right. Um, so other than that, yeah, I don't know. So you, you said you don't believe in money and that's just a it's a really that's a really curious statement i'm interested for you to maybe expound on that just just a little bit i mean what does that mean to you All right. personally i guess so i got a hard stop in seven minutes so i'll tell you my favorite story as fast as i can All right, this is my favorite thing to talk about. let's do it All right. okay so there's a um, i'd always been thinking about these things since i was since 2014 when i pl- started planning this crypto thing yeah and every time i had to describe this to people nobody could understand or understand what I was talking about. Like one out of 10 people were like, oh, blockchain, I know what that is, right? Now it's like five out of 10, which is cool. Um, so there's a book I read called Sapiens, which really helped me put all this stuff in perspective yep. by uh, you, Yuval Garage. No, Yuval Garage. And he says, okay, for uh, like 120,000 plus years of a human species, 
humans have never been in a group larger than 150 people. They've always been in small tribes. And suddenly, in the last 3,000 to 5,000 years, we've exploded to 7 billion people plus in one tribe, more or less. Yeah. We're all in one tribe now. What made that possible? And his answer was that it was the power of story. As languages evolved, people could tell something to someone who could tell it to other people and stories could breed. Hmm. And that there are three stories which shaped the future or the history of humanity. The first story is the story of empire. What someone tells you is true is true. So that's the idea of, of empires and government and law and universities, right? Okay. Then the second story is the story of religion. What you believe is true is true and unfalsifiable. Yeah. What you believe is true is true. And that's like, obviously, you can think of a ton of religions, um, Christianity, Buddhism, right? And then the third story, and the one I'm most fascinated by, is money. It's what you believe that other people believe is true is true. It's kind of weird to think about. Yeah. Money is an exchange. It's what you believe that others will believe is true. You believe that other people will respect you because you have dollars? Then dollars are true. And the best way he could explain this was that, that I understood it was, if you think of the Crusades, right? These people were believing in different things that other people were believing in. Their religions were different. Their stories were at odds. Their empires were at odds, right? Yep. But we'll, so that like these cultures could never unite. Mm -hmm. So what happened, though, is that these people from Italy and from Europe during the Crusades would go in and kill these Muslim and African invaders. Or I mean, they, would, they were the invaders. Um, invade and kill people in Africa, stealing these fundamentally and intrinsically worthless gold coins that had pictures of Muslim caliphates on it and Arabic script written on the coin. Mm -hmm. And take it back to their home country, thinking that they won. Because they believed that other people would believe that these coins were worth something. <laughs> right? And that was, what I realized is that it's not that money is shaped by culture. It's that culture is shaped by money. That all of our beliefs and all of our humanity and all of our uniting of each other over the last 100 to 500 years has been through money. That money is the great uniter across the world and it's a story that all of us agree on <laughs> everybody believes that other people will believe that it's true right and that's why i think money isn't real <laughs> <laughs> that's really deep man I'm, I'm just gonna have to go like sit in a corner and think about that for a few minutes <laughs> but I, so, I i really like it and so it, you're you're probably short on time now you got to go i got four minutes i got three minutes yeah no yeah. it's like I mean, I'm, just, I'm going to be like, I got to go in a sec, but uh, I'll tell you one other thing. It's like, if you live in a world where money is a pressure upon you, if you live in a world where you have debt, right? That money is a, it's like pressure upon you. It's like you're a fish in water. Yep. You can't get out of it, right? But if you can step outside of that water, if you step outside of the bowl, you can look at the bowl and realize that the whole world is not water, Right. If you understand that the pressure of money, the money is only important because money is success. Like you kind of implicitly define that during our talk. Yep. Um, and if you believe that money is success, then there's this pressure to make more money because that's the point system that you agree on. Yep. But if you step outside of that and say, hang on, money is just a concept. It's far less real than a tree. Mm -hmm. right? You start to understand that there are little chinks in that armor, that money can be manipulated in, in magical ways. That money has become a very manipulatable substance over the last 20 to 50 years. And that there are ways to, to, to hack the system of money uh, that aren't, aren't unethical and are not illegal. They're just, it's just seeing a concept from a different vantage point. And so I, I really hope that people who, who hear this um, respect or, or, or learn something from what I just talked about and, and at least hopefully got something out of that mindset of stepping outside of the bubble and looking upon it from another land. Absolutely, man. I, I think they did. I, I definitely did. And and with that, we'll we'll end it. Uh, successful dropouts. You've been hanging out with Manish and Kylan, learning what it takes to drop out, grind, and succeed. And for everything we talked about today, head over to SuccessfulDropout.com and type Manish into the search bar. That's M-A-N-E-E-S-H. Uh, and the show notes will pop right up with everything we talked about today. Yeah, and also if you're on a phone listening to a podcast, uh, you can download the Pavlock app. Uh, on your phone, yep. it'll all. It, you don't even need the device. It'll just let you start earning those volts right now. Um, and if you go oh, to padlock.com forward slash dropout, I'll make like a, a special link for you guys. Perfect. Yep, we'll have all that in the show notes, and I, I would highly recommend you guys go over and, and check out 
uh, Pavlock and, and everything else Manish has, has to offer. And uh, with that, uh, remember, stay hungry, stay foolish. For more information about how to drop out, grind, and succeed, go to SuccessfulDropout.com. I also love questions. If you have a question about anything we talked about today, I want to hear from you. Go to SuccessfulDropout.com and click the Ask Me a Question link at the top of the page. Successful Dropouts, if you could go to iTunes and leave a positive rating and review, it would help this show out a lot. I know you're busy. I know you got a lot going on. But if you do that, it helps this podcast rank. It helps other people listen to it and gain value just like you have been. Thank you so much in advance.